Whenever we produce a methodology, we do so on the basis of some pretty serious and pretty deep assumptions. When we decide that we might adopt a scientific approach, or one which seeks to understand the perspectives of individuals in a common experience, we also buy into particular philosophical constructs. These constructs relate not just to what counts as valid knowledge and appropriate ways of developing that knowledge, they also encompass particular versions of what the world is like, assumptions about the very nature of human reality. In this podcast, I set out to orient the listener to some of the language which is used to talk about these philosophical dimensions of methodology, and to illustrate this into two common and contrasting executions of research design. A useful entry point to this exploration is to think about knowledge generation as occurring in the field of play of a game or a sport. Methodology in this context becomes the strategy that you employ in order to work within that game, your tactics and your approach. In order for your play to be appropriate though, you'll need to play within the rules of that game, which set out what legitimate behaviour might be. In philosophy, the term epistemology is used to describe the rules of the game of knowledge generation. Epistemologies establish the kinds of basis on which valid assertions can be made, the processes and qualities of analysis, and the burdens of evidence we would expect. And this in turn has implications for the research methods we adopt. Regardless of our expertise in undergraduate or postgraduate academic practice, we're all unwittingly familiar with one particular type of epistemology in the form of the scientific method, or, to use its technical term, positivism. Positivist epistemologies suggest that valid knowledge should be generated through the careful observation of controlled environments. It suggests that we should manipulate particular variables whilst minimising the effect of others in order to ascertain their impact on a particular outcome. We might, for instance, change the temperature of a classroom and measure the consequence in children's ability to concentrate. Positivism would insist that for our understandings to be valid, they should be based on objective and value-free analysis, on precise measurement and carefully selected representative samples. Such an intent shapes the kind of research methods that are appropriate to a study. It tends, for instance, towards a preference for quantitative data and analysis, and strategies such as experiments and surveys. Positivism is, however, only one type of epistemology. Another common orientation is known as interpretivism, and establishes a different set of rules to the game of knowledge generation. It begins with the rejection of scientific method as appropriate to the study of human beings, a subject matter which, unlike chemicals in a beaker, has free will and autonomy. Interpretivism therefore suggests that we should focus on the thinking and the feeling that underpins people's behaviour and the subjective ways in which they experience their world. As a result, this approach tends towards more qualitative methods, which expose a depth of data, unstructured interviews, for instance, or participant observations. It adopts strategies such as ethnography and case study to highlight the diversity and richness of human experience, rather than seeking some kind of representative generalisation. So there are philosophical underpinnings to our choice of research methods, in the form of our epistemological stance. But it's possible to dig a level deeper than this. For our perspective on how to understand the world, how to generate knowledge about it, also implicates something about the nature of that reality we are studying. In philosophical terms, it implicates an ontology. We can illustrate this in relation to the positivist epistemology which suggests that we uncover rules about the world by carefully measuring experience in order to expose or uncover them. In the same way that I might repeatedly drop a ball in order to expose the rules of gravity. Such a perspective presupposes the objective external existence of these laws, independent of the matter which occupies them. Hence, it relies on an objectivist ontology. In contrast, Interpretivism negates this sense of overarching laws, instead suggesting that social reality is a shared accomplishment, that it arises because individuals apply meanings to their experience, which render them meaningful. These meanings might be shared, but they're not an objective thing to be taken for granted. We can construct entirely different realities by applying different meanings to our experience. As such, they talk of a constructivist ontology. To illustrate in a simplistic way, an objectivist might suggest that learners' motivations are shaped by a careful use of praise. Thus, they might apply a positivist methodology in order to evidence the causal relationship between these two factors. 
perhaps by comparing on-task behaviour in a praise-rich and praise-poor classroom. In contrast, a constructivist would suggest that how a learner interprets that praise is crucial in mediating their response. As such, they would seek to understand the experience of praise from the perspective of the learner, the ways in which they attach meaning to it, and orient their future behaviour accordingly. In designing a methodology then, the inquirer inevitably produces a version of reality and subscribes to a set of commitments in relation to how that reality should be studied. In this podcast, I've begun to illustrate this, drawing on the contrasting approaches of interpretivism and positivism, two major approaches, but by no means the only ones. A successful account of methodology is mindful to these theoretical dimensions. It draws to the surface the particular construct of reality to which it subscribes, and the model of knowledge generation it follows. It talks explicitly of its ontological and epistemological bases. Doing so enables the producer of such an account to situate their particular procedures in something deeper and more considered than simple practical necessity, and to reflect on how other philosophical approaches might challenge it and the form of its processes and conclusions.